thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, and those who are going to watch the recording, I know it's a Tuesday afternoon, so it really means a lot that you decided to show up to learn about cytology as a dermatologist. We're really passionate about cytology. It's really kind of the foundation of us managing cases, but I also understand that life is busy. The clinics are really busy. Um, we're short staffed in some situations. So we want to make sure that we have the tools to implement cytology in a way that is really practical for us in the clinics. So I just want to thank Somatica for having me here today um, to educate you on cytology and some really innovative things that are happening within that space. Um, as was mentioned, I do have a passion project called the Derm Vet. The Derm Vet came along when I kind of started really getting into speaking and then it became evident like, wow, People that are in general practice, how do you do it? Having to know so much information, you know, whether you're a technician, a veterinarian, there are so many different things that you really have to learn about and keep up to date with. So knowing that going to conferences can, you know, be a lot to learn everything you need to, I wanted a way to provide easy, tangible dermatology education to you. So I do that through social media, um, especially on Instagram but I do have Facebook as well. And then uh, through a weekly podcast that I put out that varies between me just doing short, quick solo episodes, but also having longer episodes where I have other dermatologists on, general practitioners, technicians, other specialists, just to have conversations about some of these difficult diseases that we manage. We know that dermatology often is not super straightforward in these cases. So I like to have lots of different opinions on so you can just get a better feel of how you want to practice. All right, let's jump into our bread and butter and that is cytology. Why do cytology? You know, I think we're really pretty fortunate in dermatology that we have this test that is so quick, right? I can collect a sample as I'm talking to an owner. It doesn't really take me extra time. Fairly inexpensive. I know doing repeated cytologies can add up, but if you think about the amount of information you get from a cytologic sample, let's say a case where maybe you think you need to culture that case, which we know is a more expensive test, but a cytology actually shows that it's full of malassezia or there's a lot of inflammation and not much bacteria, that is going to be cost beneficial for your client, which dermatology is a specialty that adds up over time. Non-invasive, again, it's something that's pretty simple, superficial, instant results, you know, especially when we talk about some of these AI dermatology machines like TrueView, we know that we have the ability to get instant results, whether we review it or have the ability to have a machine review it for us. And that's our minimum database. If you have a dog come in and they're just ADR, not feeling right, what would you do? You're not going to just do no diagnostic tests. You're probably going to start with something like lab work. That might not give you every single bit of information that you need, but it's going to put you in the right direction of what other tests need to be done. It's going to help rule out some stuff. And that's what cytology is to us. Cytology is our lab work. You know, it guides us to whether biopsy is the next step, culturing is the next step, referral is the next step. So that's really how I view cytology is it's the lab work of dermatology. And we utilize it so often because things can really change in these cases. What are you looking for? Now, if you are evaluating a slide, most of the time, the big things we're going to be looking for is infection. So knowing cocci, rods, yeast is really going to be helpful, but we can also see the type of inflammation that's there. If you have a cat and there's a lot of eosinophils, it's going to probably point you in the direction of some sort of hypersensitivity disorder. You know, of course, then there's the more advanced stuff like acanthalytic keratinocytes and neoplasia. And I think that... Clinicians can get really, really afraid of cytology because they don't think they'll recognize those things. But what I always teach is you don't have to feel comfortable knowing everything. You know, you get cytology and you can feel comfortable evaluating cocci, rods, malassezia, 
and weird, like you're going to gain a lot of information from collecting these samples. And the awesome thing about things like AI Derm is if you get those weird samples, you have the abil ability through something like TrueView to actually send that, that image out to be evaluated by a clinical pathologist. So you have more tools that can get you faster results if it is something you don't feel comfortable with. But just feel comfortable with things like infection and I don't know, weird, because then you can just know I'm going to biopsy, I'm going to refer. But if you are able to save the money for that client from doing cultures that don't need to be done, from putting cases on, don't, putting them on antibiotics that don't need to happen, that's still going to be really, really beneficial for our pets that we're managing. What do you need? So of course, slides, lots and lots of slides. Predominantly, most of us are still using DiffQuick. You have things like gram stains, but those are more tedious and take longer. You know, I'm in a busy clinical practice as well. So we're still using DiffQuick in the machine that we're gonna talk about today is utilizing DiffQuick. Um, confidence. You just have to feel comfortable. And I do think that collecting cytology, utilizing tools like the TrueView can really enhance your learning curve pretty quickly in collecting cytology and just feeling confident in how to implement that in the management of your cases. You know, having a good quality microscope is really important or a tool like AI dermatology. And then depending on what you're evaluating, cover slip, scalpel blade, toothpick, tape, and swab, which we will talk about as far as how to collect those. So with collection techniques, it is really important to not feel like you have to do every single collection technique out there. You know, I am very comfortable with direct impression smear. That's predominantly what I use, but I have started using a little bit more tape as I've, you know, kind of just been playing around with what I feel comfortable with. But I predominantly don't use a lot of tape. I know dermatologists that tape every single case that they look at, and that's okay if that's what you're comfortable with. Now, when you're looking at some of these AI dermatology um, machines like the TrueView, they are not able to evaluate tape because tape picks up a lot of things and puts in lots of different fields. So all the skin cells and stuff you get make it really difficult, but direct impression smear, lots of other ways of collecting swab really can be evaluated appropriately with TrueView. So let's talk about some of the collection techniques that we can consider. So direct impression smear by far is the most common one that I utilize. You're gonna use the edge of the slide at a 30 to 45 degree angle and disrupt that skin and crust. I think that's one of the biggest missteps I see is if I have a student spending time with me, I collect a sample, we get tons of cocci, they collect a sample, there's not much on it. They're often just collecting like the top portion of that crust. You need to get under the crust. The crust is the body's way of protecting itself. All that infection and inflammation is gonna be under it. So I actually use the edge of my slide to kind of lift the crust and get under that area. And they'll get under things like scale, the kind of top layer of the epidermis. And then firmly press the material onto the slide. This is great for things like moist crusted lesions because you'll get it on the slide pretty easily. So here's just examples of me collecting direct impression smear. The first video you're gonna see is of a well-behaved Frenchie that I'm doing the interdigital spaces on. The other misstep I see with direct impression smear is not using your non-dominant hand to kind of lift that skin up. So look at this video of me on the left. I'm taking my left hand on the opposite side of that interdigital space and pushing it up. This is how I am able to collect pretty good direct impression smear samples from that interdigital space. And then this is a dog that was skin testing, but you can see there's lots of papules that are present on this dog. So I take my left hand again and I kind of lift that skin and create a plateau of skin. And this makes it so I have that kind of friction. Um, I have that force on the other side. So I can press pretty firmly with my slide. So I would say that's probably one of the more beneficial tips I have when you are getting comfortable with things like direct impression smear. If you are not comfortable with direct impression smear, please, with any of these cytology techniques, Practice on pets. If you have dentals, if you have neuters, spays, practice on the pets that are sedated, anesthetized, that are still. You know, you can just get slides and practice the technique. Practice looking in ears with otoscopy. Don't wait for that pogo stick Labrador retriever that's running around the room and then decide to try to get an interdigital sample. 
because you want to get that feel on your hands, what that kind of feels like when you do have a moving target. So practice collecting cytology on some of these pets that are still that you're seeing anyway, so you can get your technique really solid. So here's just some examples of direct impression smears. So on the left, you can see um, I have the crust lifted with the edge of my slide. And that's what I mean is get under that crust so you can get that more ulcerative, erosive skin because that's where you'll often get more answers. That middle picture is a dorsal paw. It had more moist lesions. I could kind of squeeze on those follicles a bit and then some serosanguinous debris came up and I can just kind of pat my slide on that. On the right is a dorsal head where we got a focal area of pyoderma. Again, I'm taking my left hand and kind of pinching up that skin so that I can have a better ability to get more cells on my slide. Swab. So swab, we think of for ears, and we should be using it for ears, but you can actually utilize it a lot on skin. So you will just rub or roll the cotton-tipped applicator or Q-tip on the lesion and roll it onto a slide just like you would for an ear. Where I find this really helpful are those really moist lesions where maybe it's just too much stuff you get with direct impression smear, draining tracks. So when you get those interdigital furuncles, which it is spring, we are seeing a lot of those where I practice in Oregon, um, make sure you get a swab and put it in those furuncles. You can get a really good sample that way. And then what I call tricky areas. So if this is a dorsal pole. That's pretty standard. You can get direct impression smear or cotton tip swab with this. But when you have some of these tricky areas, so medial canthus, I often utilize the swab in that area because it's really hard to lift the skin there. You can try tape, but this was a more moist lesion, so that was going to be pretty difficult. And then on the right, that's a little interdigital fruncle. So you can see kind of that draining tract that's sitting there. We can take a Q-tip and put it in that so we can get a really good sample. And then please do not forget, I'm a dermatologist. We see brachycephalic dogs all day long your Frenchies, your English Bulldogs, check those facial folds. If they are rubbing their face, please check their facial folds. You know, some owners don't know to clean them. They don't know to evaluate them. You will just be surprised what you find in facial folds. And it often is infectious and really uncomfortable. And if we don't evaluate those, then we often miss the ability to provide relief. So those facial folds, swab, swab, swab. So I'm doing lots of swabs. I'm brachycephalic facial folds, tail folds. If you have a dog who is scooting, but the anal sacs feel fine, check things like the tail folds, um, perivulvar folds. So around the perivulvar region, if they're more hooded, you can get infections too. So use those swabs in those tight, really tricky areas to get a good sample. And then of course, ear canal. So the most common way to use a swab technique is to get in those ear canals because it's a tricky area. So you're gonna insert and just realize there's some limitations. When you insert that cotton swab, you are more often than not getting the vertical canal or the, the junction of the vertical and horizontal canal. You know, you're not getting the deep, deep horizontal canal. There can be some differences with that, but predominantly day to day, this is gonna be the technique most of us use. You're gonna rotate or scoop that material out to collect it and then roll it onto a slide. Please know your sample, whatever that looks like for you. So you could write an R and the L with the sample. You can base it on the frosted section. So I tend to put my right ear by the frosted section. I just say right by white. Some people put the left ear because they say left by label. Whatever feels good for you. But if that dog or cat has two ear canals, you should be having two samples. And we sometimes see dogs or cats with one ear canal because they had a Tika. But even if the owner's only complaining about one ear, please sample both. Sometimes you'll find minor infections in the other ear. And if we don't catch those, um, we that could end up perpetuating into a pretty bad infection. So I always check both ears with cytology if I'm going to be doing an ear swab. Tape prep. So again, I have started doing a little bit more of this, but I'm still not a heavy, heavy taper, but it's not inappropriate to do tape. Um, the, you're going to take the sticky side of the tape. You're going to repeatedly put it on the skin surface. Where this can be really beneficial is difficult anatomic regions. So interdigital spaces, you can see me collecting tape from a ventral interdigital space. When I have those pets who are really paw sensitive, they hate their paws being messed with. As I start trying to collect it, they're donkey kicking me. 
um, then I will go to tape because it's a bit faster. You don't have to manipulate that interdigital space as much. Um, it's also really nice for dry, scaly lesions. I can usually use direct impression smear firmly enough to get a good sample, but occasionally you'll get a dry lesion that you just don't feel like you get really good cells with direct impression. So tape prep, because it's so sticky, can be really beneficial. Again, one of the downfalls of tape is you pick up a lot of stuff due to that stickiness. So more squames, skin cells, you just have to be comfortable reading through that a bit. And then all the AI derm machines don't read tape because of the fact that there's so many different levels of views within having so much stuff on that slide. Here's another area that can be beneficial, the perioral region. So again, if you have dry, scaly lesions, I've had dogs who have presented for rubbing their face um, or halitosis, but the teeth look fine and will actually find a decent amount of infection in the perioral region. So in allergic dogs, especially, we know the perioral region actually can get infected quite easily. Um, you have to read through it a bit, right? Because we expect some bacteria to be by the mouth. But if you find a lot of malassezia or intracellular cocci, then that could be indicative that you do have a true infection that we should address. And then toothpick method. This is one of my favorite ones that not as many people in general practice do. So I will really encourage you if you have especially allergic dogs who lick and chew the paws a lot, but every time you look at them, they look fine. The interdigital spaces are pretty unremarkable. Check those claw folds. Claw folds are really sneaky, especially in allergic dogs. They often will get infection present and you can't really notice unless you pull back the claw fold or actually get something like a toothpick in there. And when we have dogs who say are managed well in Apoquil and all of a sudden they're not doing as well with it, and they're chewing their paws, more often than not, we get an infection that's just happened due to an allergic flare. So it is super simple. You're just gonna take that toothpick, insert it into the claw fold, as you can see in this picture here, scrape the material from that proximal claw or claw fold and roll the toothpick onto the slide. So here's an example of me doing it on an allergic poodle that I was skin testing. So again, just pulling back a little bit, taking that toothpick and scraping it along that claw fold. And then I'm just going to take that and put it, roll it onto a slide. You don't need much. I'll go back and do this a couple of times. I do this in plenty of dogs and cats that are awake too, and they tend to tolerate it pretty well, but you will be amazed how much it'll help your practice to be looking for things like perinechia, which is inflammation and infection along that claw fold that could be causing some issues for your really itchy pets. So here's just an example here on the left, especially like, again, I'm in Portland, Oregon. We're just getting out of the rainy season. So we get a lot of dogs who come in, these long coated dogs, they're kind of muddy, their, their fur is wet. And so it can be really hard to evaluate those areas. So here's an example of a dog that's long coated. And if you just looked at this dog's paw, you wouldn't think it looked that crazy, but this dog was totally chewing the paws, even within the exam room. Pull back on that area, get a toothpick sample, and look how much malassezia I found underneath the microscope with a quick sample. So it's really important to make sure we're evaluating for these. What's really cool is if you do get to the point you have to treat them, whether topically, systemically, and they start improving, is you can have owners watch for that brown ring kind of growing out as the new claw is growing from that claw fold. It'll push that ring out which a lot of owners like to watch. And eventually as they clip the nail, it'll come all the way off, but it's just a really nice thing for them to see that improvement with their pets. And then here's another example. Again, this is like a medium coat dog, nothing crazy, but you can just see some scaling along that claw fold, but gosh, look how much cocci we found within that claw fold. So if I just keep switching medications on this dog, okay, you're not responding to apical, let's go to side point. Okay, let's go to steroids. If there's that much infection there, they're never really going to improve. And all of a sudden the owner is going to lose a lot of faith in these medications to control the allergies long-term. So really consider doing the toothpick method in some of these claw folds. It's really, really a cool way to evaluate that area. Here's just one study that looked at looking at co uh, collection techniques at the claw folds. They looked for yeast and bacteria and claw folds of normal dogs and then allergic dogs. And they looked at toothpick, tape prep, and impression smear. 
And what they found was there are higher amounts of yeast and cocci. So they collected all of these on each dog and they found higher amounts of yeast and cocci with the toothpick method or claw folds compared to tape or impression smear. So it's just a really nice way to look at this specific area. Scraping. So this is not scraping that you would do for things like mites. This is actually a, a way to collect cytology. I do not do this often, but I occasionally do this on seborrheic dogs. You're just going to take your scalpel blade. You're not trying to make them bleed or anything like that. You're kind of just scraping off that material that you can't really get on a slide. Tape gets way too much of that scaly stuff. You just go one direction, kind of scooping that air and that material up. And then you're going to use like a bread and butter technique to kind of smear onto a slide. This is great for those scaly separate lesions where you're not getting much on direct impression smear, but tape's getting too much stuff. But again, this is something I personally don't use that often. So now let's talk about, we've got, we've got our, you know, cytology sample. Now what? You know, of course, we're used to staining the slide. We're used to looking at under the microscope. Um, and, you know, we still look at a lot of stuff ourselves under the microscope. But realizing that there are limitations, that we're all really busy, um, we're seeing more and more automated um, machines, which is great. So this is true view by Zometica. It's an automated sli slide prep. This is the only machine that actually stains the slide for you at this point in time. It'll look at hematology and then obviously what I care most about, cytology slides. So if you are really busy, it seems simple to say, well, staining, no big deal. But when you're seeing so much dermatology and your technicians or assistants are staining slides all day long, like that adds up, especially when we are in staff shortages. So this particular machine will actually um, smear if you are doing something like a blood smear. And then for us, stains, washes, dries, and actually digitizes the slide. So you can collect the sample. Again, it does not do tape, but you can collect the sample, pop it in, and I'll show you some videos of this. And then you basically just go do what you need to do or your technician can have their time back. And then this image will pop up on the screen provided within the machine so that you can evaluate what's going on and you can move around that image as well. So I'm a dermatologist, I love visual things. So this is all with actually hematology, but same would be true for cytology. You could see there, they inserted the slide, um, and for blood smears, you can just put a drop of blood and it'll actually smear it for you. For cytology, you just have your direct impression smear, and then you would actually just pop it in the same way. And then if you're doing hematology, see that? Isn't that cool? It's really fast. Like I've actually watched this work when they've opened up the machine. Let me see it there. It's drying it for you but it actually will take a slide if you're doing hematology and smear it for you right there, which is pretty cool. Then it does oil immersion for you. So it'll actually have oil immersion. So it's, it dries the slide, stains the slide, and then actually we'll put a drop of oil with on the slide so that it can be evaluated and give you that really nice image that you'll see on the screen. So that was the drop of oil right there. And then there's that little microscope head you can see in there that's actually going to evaluate the slide for you. Then you get your image. So then you pop up your image. And again, this is blood. The same would be true for cytology. So you can zoom in, you can move around, you can look for things like cocci rods, malassezia, and just get an idea of what's going on. But all that work in between in that middle portion, that time has been saved. So you can just pop out of the room and look at the image while your technician's been able to be utilized somewhere else. And then again, if you get those weird things, you can request a consult. So if you get that image and you don't feel comfortable with acanthalytic keratinocytes, or you're like, I don't know what in the world is this going on? You can actually take that same image, submit a consult, and actually write in there kind of like, here's what the pet presented with, whether it's hematology or cytology, here's what the images looked like when I looked at that pet clinically. And you can actually submit it and get a response back from clinical pathology within a couple of hours. So, you know, hopefully if you're doing things um, like hematology or cytology in the past, when we've had to send out slides, it could take days to get a response back. But now it's really nice to be able to give a response back to that client within the same day. Because if it is something like, 
skin lymphoma, you know, we want to make sure we get them in the right hands as soon as possible. So beyond just saving that time, you have the ability to get some of this stuff out faster. You know, you're not having to risk it getting lost in the mail, which I've had happen. And, you know, a year ago, a sample just got lost in the mail. We had no idea where it went. Um, so it's just taking some of that risk and some of those steps away and being able to get a faster response for your client. And then you get a really beautiful report. You can actually just, it'll kind of store everything for you. You put their information in and then you get a complete report that tells you what's going on. So it's a really nice way to kind of standardize it. You know, slide preparation, as we know, we all learn all sorts of things of how to stay in slides, what's the right way. You know, the truth is none of it's really that standardized. So this is a way to keep it pretty consistent, saves time. Again, we're all busy. We know we have doctor and staff shortages. And then I just love the quick pathology consults. You know, if you're not really sure what's going on, instead of having to mail it out, make sure it gets there, then have it read and get a response a few days later, you can get it same day. So we have lots of pathologists that are kind of waiting to read these results for you. They get the image and it's just a really nice way to digitize and to make this more modernized when we are getting things like lymphoma cases, other neoplastic cases, autoimmune cases. So let's go into some interpreting cytology. So we have our sample, we have our image. What are we looking for? So obviously lots of neutrophils. We see neutrophils all the time with pyoderma. These are acute inflammatory cells that destroy infection. The biggest thing I want you to recognize, you're probably comfortable with what neutrophils look like, but you need to recognize if there's infection or not, because there are plenty of diseases, especially things like pemphigus, which can have lots of neutrophils and not really have a lot of bacteria. So we want to be able to identify that neutrophils are there, but we also want to see if there's obvious infectious organisms. So we know if we need to consider something like biopsy. Nuclear streaming. So whenever I have students spend time with me, this often gets mistaken for things like fungal hyphae. Nuclear streaming is just rupturing of DNA from those neutrophils. So I cause nuclear streaming all the time because I kind of am pretty firm um, with my impression smears, but it is just cells that have ruptured open. You can see they don't really have segments like hyphae would. They're kind of thinner streaming. They're not uniformed in size. So this would be much different looking than something like fungal hyphae, but it's just neutrophils that you've broken open. Eosinophils. So we think of eosinophils in cats. They love finding eosinophils. They're beautiful, um, but they are phagocytizing organisms. If we find them, we predominantly think of hypersensitivity disorders. There are a few other things that can cause it, like Wells syndrome, things like that. But day to day, most of us are seeing it with hypersensitivity reactions. If I see a lot of eosinophils in a dog that I think has some sort of allergy, I do like to rule out ectoparasites. We know with things like flea bite hypersensitivity, we can see eosinophils, but also food allergy. Um, we can see them with atopy, but it's not quite as common. And then certainly we see lots of eosinophils in cats just based on the unique way that they show us their hypersensitivity disorders through things like eosinophilic granulomas. Macrophages. Macrophages are later to the game. So our neutrophils show up in the beginning aspect of something like a pyoderma, and the macrophages kind of come clean everything up later. They digest cellular debris, infections, form material, just tells you that there's been more chronic stages of inflammation, but an infection is not just a one stage thing, right? So usually you're infected, the body's trying to fight it off, but then the, the infection might be replicated. So we are what we call pyogranulominous inflammation, pyo meaning the neutrophils, granulominous meaning the macrophages. So it's pretty common for us to see a combination of neutrophils and macrophages under the microscope. And then obviously yeast, yeast we love finding, it's pretty straightforward to find. Malassezia pachydermatis by far is the most common yeast organism that we'll see, um, but we don't know for sure without something like a fungal culture, which isn't really standard to do for malassezia. Peanut are snowman shaped usually. Some people say they look like boot, print, uh, boot prints. There's something else I'll show you that I think looks more like a boot print. They can go to the cornea sites and adhere to them. So if you are using a traditional microscope, you might want to take the fine focus knob and kind of go up and down. 
Sometimes you can get non-budded yeasts that are not quite as obvious. They'll look more globoid in nature. But usually if you keep evaluating the slide, you will find a more budded yeast, which is more typical for us to see in standard infections. Cocci, got to feel comfortable with those cocci for sure. Again, we predominantly see Staphylococcus pseudonermedius, but you do not know for sure without a culture. We get things like Staph schlepheri, occasionally Staph aureus, though not very common. There's also things like Streptococcus that can occur. You'll see numerous sizes of round basophilic organisms. They can happen in clusters or chains or individually. Something you definitely want to feel comfortable seeing. If you are running something like a true view, you want to make sure when you're looking at that image and zooming in, that you feel really comfortable with the identification of cocci so that we know if we need to treat them for the infection itself. And then rods, of course, I show you a really obvious rod shape picture. They're not all this obvious. More often than not, we see Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Again, don't know without a culture for sure. The problem with any rod-shaped organism is they tend to develop resistance very quickly. So when you have things like rods within an ear canal, we need to make sure we're rechecking these pets, we're getting rid of these infections, because we see some pretty nasty resistant infections in our practice. The other problem is that rod-shaped organisms tend to be really ulcerative. So if you think about a pseudomonas ear canal that you're looking at, they're uncomfortable, they're bleeding sometimes, ulcerative. These organisms can also create biofilms. Biofilms are basically slime layers. So they have a defense mechanism where they can create a slime layer, that bacteria itself then they'll replicate, they'll trade virulence factors, and it'll make it much more difficult for your infection to, to and control to be effective. Melanin granules, this is commonly mistaken for bacteria. And again, I show you a pretty obvious picture. They're not all this obvious, but this is one that we often see um, young practitioners or students mistaken for bacteria. You want to look for them being like little small rods that are kind of refractile and more tan in color. Obviously, this is really important because if someone saw this slide and said, oh, it's just a bunch of bacteria, we may be using antimicrobials when it's not appropriate. So one trick I have is they're really refractile. So take your fine focus knob and kind of move it up and down and see if those refractile back at you. Bacteria doesn't tend to do that. You can also just resample. If it's a dark dog, you know, go resample. Maybe you'll get a more obvious sample that looks like melanin granules, but we do tend to see this more in hyperpigmented skin or dark skin dogs. Dermatophyte. So dermatophyte, again, this is something where I'd expect you not, maybe not to know what it is, but just to say that's kind of weird. Um, you do not have to find dermatophyte spores or hyphae on a slide itself, but you can. So you're not going to find macroconidia. You can only find that if you actually grow a fungal specimen on DTM and then use lactophenol blue to evaluate it. But you can see spores, like you see that cluster of spores in the middle of this slide or hyphae. But if they don't see those and you feel like it could be dramatified as a differential, please still run, you know, your fungal PCR, DTM. There's pros and cons to both of those, but just do a further workup. Focus on areas of inflammation. So if I'm worried that it's dramatified and I have the ability to really take my time on the slide, I really go to where there's neutrophils or nuclear streaming to look for those spores. Then acanthalytic keratinocytes, these often get called fried egg cells. If you see a lot of these acanthalytic keratinocytes, they're just skin cells. They're just skin cells that are prematurely lifted because of what pemphigus does. But if you see these fried egg cells in a bunch of neutrophils, just know there's something else going on. Now, technically, trichophyton, which is a form of dermatophyte and staphylococcus pseudonermedius can cause acanthalytic keratinocytes, but usually you don't find a lot of them. You just find one or two. But these are just skin cells that have lost their intracellular connection because pemphigus attaches the desmosomes, which all of these skin cells basically hold onto one another to create a sheet of skin, and pemphigus attach, uh, attacks these connections. So these are skin cells that have prematurely lifted and they haven't gone through that appropriate maturation process, which the epidermis goes through in order to actually flake off a normal corneocyte. 
Okay. So through all that, one of my favorite things to do is go through some cases just to really show you why utilizing cytology is so important, how it really changed what we did in some of these cases and to prove why it is our minimum database in dermatology. So here's an example of a dog that presented um, had been on five rounds of cephalosporins and never got better, in fact, got worse. So if you pause right there, if you have a case that over and over again, you put on antibiotics and it's not fully resolving, we automatically should be thinking this is a resistant infection or this is not an infection. So we don't want to just keep guessing with the antibiotics and throwing them at cases if they're not fully resolving. Cytology had never been done on this case, so we collect cytology from the, and there's some pretty big pustules, but we get this. And again, even if you saw this one, if you did it on TrueView, you could send it to a clinical pathologist. But even if you evaluated this yourself and said, I don't know what that is. If you don't put this dog on its sixth round of antibiotics, I am so happy, you know, just say, well, that's weird. And what do we do if something is weird and not infectious? We refer or biopsy. And so this was a case of pemphigus. Pemphigus, we think of being a really crested disease. It actually starts out as a pustular disease, but because those pustules are pretty fragile, they break open easily and become crust. But we can see it be more of a pustular disease. Again, here's a different presentation. So this is the same thing. This dog had been on several rounds of antibiotics. This is what we call a moth eaten alopecia. Staph often causes this. So it's not inappropriate to consider this being a superficial bacterial folliculitis at all, but this dog was not improving on antibiotics. What had not been done? Cytology. So with this lesion, I'd go toward the edges myself. I would take a, a slide. I would do direct impression smear around the edges because usually in these types of lesions, it's kind of like a spreading uh, folliculitis. It'll kind of start and keep spreading follicle to follicle. So the more active stuff is usually going to kind of be on the periphery of that lesion. We see this. Even if you don't feel confident to say this is dermatophytosis, I would hope that you'd at least say that's not bacteria, something weird's going on. Even the category of just saying that looks fungal would be really important. Why is this extremely important? Is this is a contagious disease, you know, to pets and to the owners. Ignore the fact that my technician's not wearing gloves because they should be. I made them wash their hands really well. But this is something that we really should be concerned about because this is something that can spread to other people, can spread to other pets, and it is just getting thrown on antibiotics, which is not going to get rid of it. So this is why things like cytology is so important to make sure that we at least get this pet on the right path rather than just continuously throwing antibiotics at it. Here is a cat's toe. Now, what I'll tell you, what's interesting about cat claw folds is usually when we see swollen, crusty cat claw folds, we are concerned about pemphigus foliaceus, but we always get weird cases. So this is a case that I actually collected a sample on cytology and saw, it a lot, saw a lot of eosinophils. And you can occasionally get forms of pemphigus that will be a little bit more eosinophilic. So I actually still ended up biopsying this cat and it came back as an eosinophilic granuloma. This is a very young cat. It was just that one toe. It was very bizarre, totally responded to steroids and antibiotics. But as soon as we stopped, it came back. This was completely food responsive. So put the cat on a diet trial, we're able to get off steroids, challenge the food, just this one toe flared. That cat stayed on the food for a couple of years. And then the owner said, do we really need to keep doing this? Switch the food, the cat flared again. So it was a very bizarre presentation of food allergy. But again, seeing all the eosinophils at least got me on the right path to know what to do. This is a dog that presented a 12 year old dog that was itchy and just had this red scaly spot on the top of the back. This is the dorsal interscapular region. This is not that crazy looking, right? Like we see lots of really bad infections, lots of really bad allergies. So it'd be easy. This had been put on tons of topicals. The rest of the dog looked fine. The dog's acting fine. I've been put on topicals, never really got better, was moderately paritic to this spot. And then it just kind of kept getting a bit more red and scaly. Cytology shows this. And again, even if you don't feel comfortable to say this is skin cancer, 
I would hope you'd at least say it's not bacteria. That's kind of weird. And this is one where if you had a sample like this that you evaluated on TrueView, you could send out to a clinical pathologist pretty quickly. But this is one we did end up confirming with biopsy had epitheliotropic lymphoma. You know, any dog that has not really had a history of skin lesions and all of a sudden they're older and having skin lesions that were never present before, we can have late onset allergies, but it's not very common. So you have to keep things like cancer in mind, you know, pyoderma from an, from an endocrinopathy in mind, because it's just not as typical to not have signs of allergies at a younger age and then develop them when you're senior. So again, I live in Portland, Oregon. So this dog came in, I was like, that's gross. Is that mud? Like when we flipped over this cloth fold, but this was a case that actually was really pruritic to the pause, but the inner digital spaces looked fine. And then you could see, this is what I call everything but the kitchen sink. We've got everything, cocci rods and yeast, but this is a long coated dog and I'm flipping over the cloth fold in this picture. But when it was not flipped over, it was really hard to see this nasty material. So here's another example. This is a dog who developed skin lesions as they got older, didn't pre previously have skin lesions, and then broke out with kind of this ulcerative, like not really that itchy, like pretty dramatic skin lesions. We get cytology, and this is why it can be really important if you're doing manual cytology with a microscope to start at a high, like a lower view. Because if I just jumped to oil without evaluating, I would think that those are just areas that didn't stain well. But when you actually look at this picture, you can see it's pretty uniformed in shape. And this was actually demeticosis found on cytology. So this is a dog who ended up having hyperadrenocorticism that was causing demodex. And we don't see demodex quite as much now with the isoc sazolines, but we still see it. So definitely make sure you keep that as a differential in cases like this. So this is that case I showed you before with the swab technique. So what was really interesting about this case, and this I think is a great case to show why it's important to recollect samples. So this is a case I saw in 2020. So it was just after the pandemic started. The owner was a young girl. She was actually abroad in the Peace Corps. And when the world started shutting down, she came home, but brought a dog with her. So brought a stray dog with her. This dog started developing these lesions. This dog was terrified, right? And we're like curbside and the dog's terrified. And we tried our best to kind of get samples in, you know, fear-free manners. Um, and I just saw like inflammation. And so I was actually had sedated this dog to biopsy this dog, thinking it was some weird autoimmune thing. When the dog was sedated, I said, you know, now that he's still, let's try to actually just recollect a cytology sample. And when I did, this is what I saw. And this is the slide we saw before. He had dermatophytosis, totally makes sense. He was running around the streets, definitely could have been exposed to ringworm and then brought it home across the world. So what was cool about this case was I, you know, this owner loved this dog in the short amount of time she had it. I got to call her and tell her, guess what? We do not need to spend several hundred dollars to do biopsies. Your dog has ringworm, you know, we're going to do, we still did testing to speciate it, but we were able to treat this dog for a couple of months and completely cure it. So it was just nice to be able to save the owner that cost. But this is where, like, if you have a pet that's fearful, aggressive, you can't get a good sample from, it's not inappropriate to sedate or repeat cytology so that you can get a better idea of what's going on. This is a more typical case. I would hope you could see this and it's a depigmented muzzle. This is one of my mentors cases and just say like, that's not allergies. This is very standard pimpigus foliaceous. Again, those a close up view of acantholytic erotinocytes with a bunch of neutrophils surrounding it. This is the flips of what we saw before. So this is a dog and I'm gonna get my soapbox. If you will follow the Durham vet, you know I say that we do not diagnose yeast based on it smelling like corn chips or looking like an elephant. So this is a dog that had actually failed multiple azoles. So had been put on lots of different antifungals, assuming that this was ringworm. Cytology had never been done. So when we collected cytology, and this dog is very itchy, smells like corn chips, um, and is losing hair and very uncomfortable. But look what we find under the microscope. No malices at all. This is actually a methicillin resistant staph. So again, why it's so important to be collecting cytology on these cases, 
we're delaying relief. We are potentially perpetuating resistant infections and we're not putting this pet in the right path to get better, but also get an appropriate diagnosis. But sometimes it looks like yeast, it smells like yeast, it actually is yeast. So I'm not denying that that does happen a lot, but we need to see how much yeast is there. We want to make sure there's not yeast and cocci there. So we still want to make sure that we're getting these samples. Then here's a kitty that had a paw pad that you can see is more ulcerative and uncomfortable. And then if you look under the microscope, again, this is a great one that you could send to a clinical pathologist. If you were going to get a sample, this is plasma cell pododermatitis. Um, this can affect one paw pad. This can affect many paw pads. If it's more ulcerative like this, you can get a pretty comfortable diagnosis just with something like a direct impression smear. You can aspirate these as well, um, but we've occasionally had to biopsy them if they're not straightforward. But with plasma cells, you see that kind of eccentrically placed nucleus and all that cytoplasm kind of taking over one side of the cell. And then here's another case that had at a senior age developed really pruritic lesions. You can see it's kind of got these like little bulla, hemorrhagic areas, depigmentation. Looking under the microscope again, this is abnormal cells and this is epitheliotropic lymphoma. So we do see a lot of allergies in dermatology, but not everything we see is allergic. That's why it's really important to collect these samples so that I can get this pet on the right path, you know, which is was to biopsy and get them to an oncologist. This one's a bit uh, different just based on the presentation alone. It should give you an idea of what's going on. I would tell you this is a younger dog because I know anytime we see a boxer with a nodule, it's easy to think neoplasia, which, you know, we definitely would want to rule that out still. But this is a dog that when we actually got some direct impression samples, you can see a lot of inflammation um, and not much actual infection. But this is actually a leprite granuloma when we ran an acid fast stain. This is a form of mycobacterium. Short-coated dogs, especially boxers, who get nodules at the base of their ear, a very, very common presentation of this. So again, you get your cytologies just to see the inflammation and then talk to the clinical pathologist about any other diagnostics you need to do, like special stains, biopsies with special stains, tissue cultures, things like that. Here's a puppy. This puppy had been treated for puppy pyoderma. So you know, treated with antibiotics at a young age, didn't get better, in fact, got worse. And then we saw this before in an older dog, but this is a younger dog. If you go at low power, again, you see little Demodex. So got to make sure with these young dogs, especially if they're not on an isox sazzling, to be scraping them, you can get Demodex. That can kind of be more pustular. Um, obviously, in juveniles, we often can get them treated pretty easily, and they don't necessarily have a chronic disease like we see in older dogs causing this, but it's definitely an important thing to recognize. Here's a close-up view of that Demodex on cytology. And then I showed you that crusty cat claw fold earlier. Here is another crusty claw cat claw fold. This is be what we see more commonly. Um, Here's neutrophils, and this is a beautiful picture. Cats can be really stingy with these cells, so you don't always get this many, but you can see neutrophils in just these beautiful kind of basophilic large fried egg cells, and this would be that standard pimbigus cat. So cats who get crusty claw folds or purulent debris in their claw folds, it's just not that common for us to get bacterial paronychia with allergies in cats compared to dogs. Dogs, we get it all the time. But cats, if you get a cat who has pus at their claw fold, crust at their claw fold, especially numerous claw folds, pimpigus until proven otherwise in a cat. It's just a very unique presentation we see in them. And then this is a dog. Sometimes you guys probably have this too. You have these dogs who come in. You, they look like they're licking their paws and the owner's like, nah, they're not really licking their paws that much. Here's a, a cytology. If you see what, this is what I consider more of those like boot print um, organisms. This is something called conchoformibius. It was previously called Simon Ciela. Those kind of boot print looks, you can see a few rod shaped bacteria on the lower right portion of that right picture, but those three larger organisms that look like boot prints, those are actually normal bacterial flora in the mouth. So you'll fly, find these sometimes like around the perioral region, or if they're licking their paws, you'll find it there. 
So it's a nice way to be able to say mm, they actually really are licking that area. But people often freak out when they see this. It's actually normal oral flora, but it just gives you an indication that that pet is licking. And then here's one of my disastrous little cases. Um, but this is another example of this dog looks really red, uncomfortable, didn't really have an odor to it, but obviously looks really bad. Um, and this was a really, really terrible chronic malassezia hypersensitivity from a dog that has food allergies and atopic dermatitis. So we definitely have to manage him. He's one of those unfortunate cases. We have to keep on chronic azoles, but it's important for us to look because sometimes he breaks out with pyoderma as well. And with that, if you follow anything I do on the derm vet, I say cytology, everything. It says whenever you call us for a consult, we're going to say, you know, if you say there's a weird looking lesion, we're going to say cytology it. They're looking at an area, cytology it. They just got treated for infection. How do I know when to stop? Cytology it. Please, please, please just cytology everything. It really is our minimum database. You have these tools like TrueView now that you can use to get faster results, to save time. You know, find those two or three techniques that you enjoy and become an expert. Also correlate clinical findings with cytology results. You know, like that case that I repeated the cytology on, like, you know, that's the beauty of cytology is you can repeat it pretty easily and then utilize these innovative tools. You know, these AI derms, they fit within your practice and your workflow. I think it's a great option um, just to make sure we can provide the best care for these pets. And with that, I just want to thank all of you. Again, we love cytology and derm. We're doing it all day, every day. My techs are almost like freaked out if I don't collect a cytology on a pet. Um, and really just explain to owners the value of it, how much info you're getting, why we need to do it. Um, but with that, I just want to thank Zometica again for having great innovative tools and also sponsoring this lecture. I want to thank all of you who are here on a Tuesday afternoon and those of you that are watching the recording. Um, with that, I'm happy to take any questions there are.